Thank you for that. Hello, everyone. So, as Victoria has said, I am the former editor of Labor Graphics Magazine, which is also a former magazine. Uh, we published from 2010 to 2016, and then gave up because it took too much time and effort, and it wasn't a job for any of us. But what I will be talking about today is one of the issues raised in the course of that work, uh, which is how to get graphic designers to actually believe that it's reasonable to use free Libra and open source software for graphic design work, because we spent five years trying to do that. And um, I should say, I have a background in graphic design. So I'm trained as a graphic designer. I have a BFA in it. These days, I'm an academic, but I'm afraid that happens sometimes. Oops. Um, <laughs> But so for me, this is, this is a big issue uh, because there's this enormous prevalence of belief that you need to use Adobe Creative Suite to be a graphic designer. And it's just straight up, full on, not true at all. Uh, and we spent years proving it in print, which is the hardest thing. But let me go back and do a little bit of an anecdote. In 2009, when I was fresh out of design school and very sure of myself, uh, I gave a talk at Libra Graphics meeting in Montreal about why graphic designers don't use open source software. Go figure. And at the time, I had a bunch of reasons based on my own very meager at the time experience, because I was a brand new graduate. I was working a bit. I was exhibiting a bit. I had friends who were designers, but you know not very big experience to draw on to say, here is why unilaterally graphic designers don't use your software to a bunch of open source software developers. Mm. And the reasons I gave don't matter, but they're roughly the same as the reasons I bring to you today with nine years more experience and no more empirical data than I had at the time. Because I don't have a pocket full of numbers on adoption of free Libra and open source software by graphic designers. No, that's fine. They don't move. I move them. Yes, thank you, though, Hilke. Because I haven't gotten to this part yet, but I will now. So in 2010, uh, two colleagues and I, two friends, uh, who run a design studio called Manufactura Independente, which is based out of Porto in Portugal, we did this. And this was done at Libra Graphics Meeting 2010 in Brussels, where we are now. And this was a thing that we were commissioned to do by uh, an arts organization that was running LGM that year, and we liked it. So we made this little print publication of work on Libra Graphics. And, you know, it was okay, right? We got better after that. Uh, but having done this one little thing, we decided that we wanted to do it again and properly. So from that point, for the next five years, we spent far too much time and far too much of our own money publishing a quarterly uh, print magazine on professional quality uses of free Libra and open source software. And it was very pretty. And we used all of the normal things that people who develop free software use. Uh, this is a little artist's rendering of what our Git logs look like. Uh, we, do, we use GitLab. Uh, at the time, it was Gatorius. Um, and you can see you know, how we worked on it. I did the majority of the editorial heavy lifting. They did the majority of the layout. And so you see these sort of spates of activity. Eventually, we convinced our columnists to actually contribute through the version control system as well, which was pretty good. And because we licensed it under a permissive license, we wound up with things like this some random other people decided that they wanted to do a collection of the first volume of the magazine. So they printed this wonderful, totally not bootleg, right, collected volume of volume one of Libra Graphics magazine on, you know, normal paper. It's wonderful. Um, but super cool, right? The kind of transformative use that we wanted to see. We did this, you know, I mean, this is the sort of variety of work we did in the five years that we did it. Because the purpose, this is at Fosdem, by the way, uh, the purpose was to prove that one could do print design 
with a purely free software workflow because historically people had said to us, as well as in general, that maybe free and open source software is fine if you're just doing web design, but it's not going to cut it for print. So we spent five years fighting with Scribus, for example. Ha ha ha. Um, we spent five years using Inkscape, using the GIMP, using version control systems, using Vim and Nano and blah, 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 right? Um, <coughs> the Vim Morris. I use Nano. They use Vim. We don't care. Um, and it was beautiful, and it was wonderful, and we did it for a goodly while. And we showed off wonderful work, like the icon set from KDE, right? Great stuff. But the question still remains at this point, why don't other people do this? It's eminently possible. We have proved it's possible. Many people have proved it's possible. The evidence of this room is that it is possible, right? Since there's now a lovely new movement of people promoting open source design. Awesome. So this morning I went on a popular tech job website and did a little search for graphic design in Berlin because, you know, there's lots of companies hiring lots of people to do computer poking things in Berlin. And of the 10 results I found on the first page of my search that were actually seeking out a graphic designer, in those 10, three of them didn't mention Illustrator or Photoshop, which is pretty awesome. There were actually three jobs for graphic designers that did not explicitly require competency in Illustrator or Photoshop. Of the seven that did, one of them actually said, or equivalent wireframing and illustration software, also awesome. But that means that in my very unscientific survey of 10 jobs, 60% of them required that you have competency in Adobe Creative Suite in order to get the job, period. Now, given that these days I have rolled over from being a designer to being an educator, I find this enormously problematic. Because if I want to wander into a graphic design classroom and teach a bunch of university students how to be designers, they're going to want to learn Adobe Creative Suite because they will look at the marketplace that they will be walking into as graduates and they will say, ah, this is the thing I need to do to get a job. It was like this when I was in design school. We rebelled when in our 3D modeling class they weren't teaching us Rhino because some people said, yes, but we need Rhino to get jobs. So what did we do as students? We organized workshops in Rhino in order to get the competencies we thought we needed to be employable, because unfortunately, I wish we lived in a different world where we didn't all need to be employed, but, you know, rent tragically must get paid. Um, yeah, I know. Um, and I would love it if we could be paying our rent in more ethical ways than we are currently able to do. So, the question that I put in this talk in the, uh, the abstract for it is, let's see, what did I say? What kinds of ecosystems do we need to have to successfully do Libra graphics in professional contexts? And when I say Libra graphics, I also include, you know, open standards and permissive licenses and all of those wonderful things that make up the ecosystem of floss. This is an open question at this point and one that I'm still trying very hard to think about. Um, and what time am I at? Oh, here's the good news. I had an energy drink this morning and it worked. So I've burned through most of what I have to say in 10 minutes, which is awesome because I only wanted to take 15 because I do want to leave some time for you all. But a thing I'm working on at the moment is since we know that in the big companies, Generally speaking, including in some companies that make money off of open source, uh, proprietary software for graphic design is the dominant paradigm. A lot of people who want to do work with flops in design uh, tend to open their own little studios and do really nice work 
you know, for cultural organizations, for example. And there's some wonderful examples of that in Brussels. There's a great group of people called Open Source Publishing who do really nice work using free software. Uh, there's several examples in Brazil, you know, people doing, again, great professional work for money, shocker, uh, in the context of small studios using free software, which is a great thing because it's totally doable, it's totally possible, and you shouldn't need to be stuck in a proprietary ecosystem where you're being charged an arm and a leg to use a piece of software that you have no control over. I apologize if I sound a bit like a free software zealot, but I am, so. So it's a bit logical that I would sound that way. Um, so some questions that I've started thinking about with colleagues who also try to teach floss graphics tools to design students, we exist as a, as a subset of people. Um, there's at least six of us who are, you know, wandering around being like, how do we get this in universities? And how do we have our students and administrators not kill us for teaching the wrong things? <laughs> yes. Um, so we've been thinking about how do you make curriculum that introduces these things as, for example, a choice, right? Because it's a bit ridiculous to go to a university degree and be taught how to use a specific version of one piece of software. It's not super smart because you're going to go obsolete pretty fast, right? You still need to learn the next version when it comes out. And goodness knows we all grumble when we get an update on something, right? So, oh no, an update has been pushed. Will my computer work? Oh no, there's a new version of Photoshop. Where have they moved the thing that I use every day, right? So it seems a bit counterintuitive that we spend three years or four years teaching students how to use a specific thing that then goes out of date and treating that as, as necessary. So one potential paradigm choice in software education. So thinking about how you teach the principles of design while also providing students with options about how they execute on those principles. But these are open questions at this point, and I didn't come up with a very good conclusion to this. In my notes, I have this, this point six, which uh, I'll move on to a prettier slide to contextualize this. My, my very illuminating note for myself is, as I look back at what we did with Libra Graphics Magazine, I wonder how we feed into the education employment ecosystem. And, you know, unfortunately, I've walked up here with a little story and a lot of energy and no conclusions to this other than wouldn't it be nice if we could get out of the clutches of Adobe as people feeding into systems that, you know, rely on open source, right? As we're all standing here or sitting here in the case of most of you, uh, as we're all in this room thinking about ideas on open source design, I, I would like to be the slightly grumpy one, this is my grumpy face, um, and say, though it is wonderful for people to contribute design of any kind to open source software products, projects, not products, that's a Freudian slip, um, though it is wonderful for people to be contributing to open source and free software in any way, it would be so much better if we were all using free Libra and open source design software instead of the big Hydra that is Adobe Creative Suite because it's just as good. The only reason you're not using it is because you're not used to it or because you're locked in by, you know, corporate interests and your own education and, and, and. <sighs> Yeah, wouldn't it be nice if we were better people? Um, here's some magazines. I'll stop talking now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I hope there are some. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, no, uh, because we're total snobs, and um, our our belief we we were sort of raised as designers on beautiful print magazines. So I spent my education reading print, which is the name of an actual really beautiful graphic design magazine. My two European colleagues were used to reading I and Emigre. And, you know, like, when we were in school, I don't know how it is now, uh, print was still super important, right? Like, young graphic designers and older ones get their hands on magazines and read them and enjoy them and hand them to other people and put them on coffee tables. And that was what we wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, can you show us some examples? Uh, tell us some examples of what you're teaching. So what well, you're teaching, what design, of course, design? yeah. I mean, if you want to do raster graphics, you can use GIMP. You can use Krita. If you want to do vectors, you can use Inkscape, which is wonderful. <coughs> I realized the other day that I've been using Inkscape for a decade, which is ridiculous. Um, you know, but... I have actually been using Inkscape as my primary vector graphics tool for a decade. It's possible. Uh, <clears throat> we won't talk about layout because that's a bit of a, a fuzzy area. But if you're doing anything with 3D, right? Wonderful stuff. Blender, amazing. Lots of people actually have a preference for using Blender. Uh, but to me, the sort of the workhorses are GIMP and Inkscape because they're your and I hesitate to say this because there's a GIMP developer in the room, but they're your replacements for Photoshop and Illustrator, right? They're not directly equivalent, which is a very important thing to remember because you can't expect to wander into the GIMP and have it work like Photoshop, but they do the same work, you know? You can be just as good a designer with GIMP instead of Photoshop and Inkscape instead of Illustrator. Yeah. Some people argue that proprietary software is just easier to use. Um, do you think this is an, is an actual issue, or have they just learned the proprietary software? And, yeah. To me, there's two prongs in that. One is, yes, they have learned it. And when you learn something, it becomes your default if it's the first thing you learn. right? Like if you're switching over from Mac to Linux, yeah, of course you will say Linux. It's so difficult. It's so unintuitive. I hate the word intuitive, right? Because what is intuition? It's just the things that you've learned and internalized. Uh, however, of course, uh, those proprietary software packages are made by companies that can afford to employ people who do usability work, uh, which hey, isn't it great that open source design exists? Because suddenly there's a community of people who have some expertise in usability and user research and UX who can be feeding into the free Libra and open source graphics software that, that we should all love and that maybe some of us do already love. But yeah, so yes and no. Yeah. So like, as a designer who started with free software tools, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think like it's very easy from our perspective to be like, oh yeah, those tools are so great or whatever. Like if only we could use Adobe stuff, but actually there's a lot of really basic stuff that Inkscape can write that Illustrator is just garbage at. Sure. And it's just we're we're used to like working around different issues, I think. Yeah. Um, and like a lot of it just comes down to what you grew up with, and, mm -hmm. and that's what people are, are stuck with. Totally, and that's the thing we need to remember about all software, right? Yeah. We're always all working around things. Oh, goodness. Are we? Oh, I think that's it. Yeah. Cute. Thank you. Thank you.